Welcome to another episode of Worldview, the foreign policy show from Hindustan Times. And joining us today is Gareth Bailey, the director for South Asia and Afghanistan with the uh, UK's Foreign Commonwealth Office. But he also wears the hat of uh, the Prime Minister's special representative for Pakistan and Afghanistan. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, bilateral relations and also stuff happening in the region. Brexit coming up uh, very soon, by the end of the month. And uh, what's, what, what's next in the relationship between India and the UK? Well, thank you, Reza, first for the opportunity to, to appear with you. And the Hindustan Times is a must read uh, with my colleagues in the British High Commission. So I'm really delighted to be with you here today. Uh, it's usual that people then start with the Brexit question, and uh, quite rightly so. Uh, I think the, the simplest way of putting this is that 2020 is the year in which Brexit gets done. And that comes uh, with a, a really powerful sense of energy in terms of pursuing uh, Britain's global agenda as Global Britain, as our Prime Minister Johnson coined that phrase. So when Global Britain looks outwards, where does she look? She looks to our natural friends and partners. And uh, I, uh, I hope I'm not uh, accused of exaggerating that India will be seen as a number one partner. And also, uh, of course, as trading partners and investors together. The numbers are incredible, uh, uh, extremely strong. And uh, the challenge then put to my team in London is, well, how can you actually improve in something which is pretty perfect already? So is, there, is, is, there, is work on a free trade agreement going to be something that's going to be topping the agenda? So we'll get there when we get there. Uh, obviously, uh, having a, uh, a really uh, frictionless and, and successful trading and investing relationship with India is going to be a, an ambition of the British government. Also, you know, UK is the base for European operations for a large number of Indian companies, uh, you know, and there have been some concerns whether this shift is going to affect their, their destiny. Uh, what steps are being taken to look at that issue? Well, um, you wouldn't expect me necessarily go, to go into the nitty-gritty of this, um, but uh, you know, let me reassure uh, readers that uh, that kind of concern is uh, right at the top of, uh, of our agenda to make sure that you know, anxiety falls away. You know, India is... Uh, is the third, um, third largest investor in the United Kingdom. And uh, Indian investment employs over 100,000 jobs in the UK. Uh, the British government, which has currently three cabinet ministers of, uh, of Indian origin, is extremely seized of uh, making sure that any anxiety of that nature is not materialized. Also, you know, there's been a lot of talk, especially at the Raisina Dialogue, which you've been here for, uh, about a rules-based order, about you know uh, maintaining uh, stability on the on the seas, and you know there's been a lot of work done in the last few years on the Quad and Indo-Pacific. But of course, the Indian Ocean is a region where both India and the UK have a lot of interest. Uh, how are you going to work together in that region? So I, I'm glad you raise it um, because uh, when the world will often speak of the Indo-Pacific, which is an enormously wide scope. Uh, Sometimes it just um, it matters to be able to bring this to a very tractable, comprehensible, understandable part of the world. And the Indian Ocean region has had attention wax and wane over it over the decades. And as I uh, look now at the Indian Ocean region, I think there's a, there's a very strong sense um, that the UK and India can work together and can work together in the most obvious way in terms of joint military exercises, but also in ways that are less seen. Uh, a whole spectrum of commitments that we can work with one another on, uh, by which I mean maritime domain awareness, illegal and unreported fishing, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, the security and safety of sea lines of communication. So much trade passes through the Indian Ocean region and that trade needs to be secured. So let me take it from a, a, another way which is uh, the UK is very much back uh, with a strong commitment throughout all of those uh, areas I described, but let me just draw attention uh, first and foremost to our uh, recapitalized Royal Navy, our uh, Queen Elizabeth class carrier strike group, which, um, as we have often said, uh, is a, 
a capability that needs to go somewhere. It needs to go somewhere in service of the global public good and the regional public good. So there's one, uh, grey hull or naval capability. The second issue, which we often walk around and we should just walk straight through, is what uh, uh, is the matter of the British Indian Ocean Territory. Britain is very clear about her sovereignty over the territory. At the same time, is extremely clear of what that territory can do for regional public security goods. It's a capability uh, that is in service of all, not in service of one. And uh, I think the government of India knows that uh, very, uh, very clearly, that there's a, there is a, a powerful sense of a security and uh, indeed um, securing capability that uh, works for the whole of the Indian Ocean region. And if you put a map of the world with the British Indian Ocean Territory at the middle of it, what you find is that we're talking about something at the center of the center of the Indian Ocean region. Talking about Afghanistan, um, it's the country has gone through a very protracted and very difficult presidential election. We still don't have the final results. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a great amount of clarity about what the U.S. is talking with the Taliban about. Where does that leave us in Afghanistan? I often counsel um, my friends in the U.K. internationally um, that patience is a virtue uh, in, in the space of, of, of peacemaking in Afghanistan. Our, our latest uh, commitment has now been 18, 19 years in, in duration and scope. And... Uh, for all of those years, we have had a very clear focus on supporting the Afghan state and the Afghan people for a lasting settlement, which can be enduring, which can allow uh, uh, something which I know many Afghans desire, which is for foreign troops to be able to withdraw and go home and have Afghanistan look after herself and in the region. Um, and notwithstanding some remarks I've heard today here in the dialogue about a you know, lack of clarity, uh, uh, and uh, you know, a sense of you know, where does this go next? Um, I would say this has been a really uh, courageous and innovative year past and no doubt year ahead in terms of trying to strike an, a new deal. Uh, the, uh, it's really important in all of this to remember that uh, the Afghan government and the Afghan people need to be at the center of that deal. The United States and the Taliban have been working on uh, a sidebar arrangement, which they themselves would say is, uh, is, is necessary, but not sufficient, not complete. And really we should focus forward now at uh, the prize that we all uh, value and are aiming for, which is an intra-Afghan negotiation. That's the thing to come. That's a ceasefire, the story for. a ceasefire at least. A reduction in violence first, a ceasefire will come, a ceasefire must be part of um, the, uh, the negotiation process as well. Um, but ultimately, uh, we have learned the very hardest way in our own close to home conflict, which is that if you uh, make an end to violence, the prerequisite for moving forward on peace negotiations, then you give the power to the spoiler. And by doing that, uh, you set back your own ambition. So uh, the bravest of the brave are those who negotiate against the backdrop of violence. You know, um, at the dialogue, something that came up was uh, something that a lot of people in India have been saying for quite a while, and even Afghanistan, you know, that when you look at Afghanistan, the other element that you have to carefully consider is Pakistan given the fact that there are still a lot of groups that operate in Afghanistan which have linkages with Pakistan and with their military. Where does the UK stand on this? So generally, you know, it is very clear that um, um, groups operating out of Pakistan are um, a source of instability both to the government of Pakistan um, and to the region. And it is vital and important that uh, Pakistan works to combat terrorism and extremism. We have that d d discussion with uh, the government of Pakistan at all levels. And we do not claim that this is some uh, thing we, we do lightly or easily. 
But we do think that by having a clear relationship with the government of Pakistan, clear discussion, access at all levels, we are playing our part in supporting the government of Pakistan to do the right thing. I remember in the aftermath of the Mumbai attacks, the UK was right at the forefront of pushing Pakistan to take action against groups that target India. Uh, but we haven't seen the trial of the Mumbai attackers going anywhere. Uh, groups that you know continue to pose a threat to India are operating relatively freely, despite you know the restrictions that have been placed on them by the UN, by the US. Uh, do you think Pakistan is doing enough right now to cut down on terrorism? I I know what the hard uh, data will tell us because the Financial Action Task Force, uh, to which we're the secretary on the Pakistan front, is um, is uh, an extremely impartial, technical, and serious body. And it says there are a number of commitments, over 20, that need to be uh, acted upon and that some of those commitments have been achieved and many more still need to be done. So more needs to be done. Uh, we, when we have uh, discussions with the government of Pakistan, uh, get um, very quickly into the heart of the matter, which is that a step change is required in order to ensure that um, both the government itself, its people, but also the region, are stable. And that's, uh, you know, that is a, a continuing, a, I, mean, I would not say almost daily conversation, but uh, not far from it. We have another very important meeting of the FATF coming up, which is, yeah. with the, you brought up the, uh, the body. Uh, what, what next? I mean, th 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 there have been repeated concerns expressed by the FATF that it hasn't delivered on the action plan in a timely manner. Is there a fear that they could move from the grey list to the black list? Well, fear is a powerful word. Um, I think something that is not often remembered or talked about uh, in, uh, in the annals of the Financial Action Task Force is that indeed the United Kingdom uh, co-nominated with the United States, the grey listing of Pakistan in the original, in the original uh, proposal that was put. Again, not an easy decision, but a decision based on uh, the assessment that on the merits of the case that was being put to the task force, uh, action was required and that therefore an action plan needed to be embarked upon and that plan is being worked through. At this stage, we're close to, of course, another plenary discussion. All options are on the table, and those options are worked through on the basis of evidence submitted. Pakistan has submitted a body of evidence, and we're working through that body of evidence. Uh, what will happen on the day, I, I think it is early to tell. Closer to home, you know, Kashmir has been back in the news again because there was a discussion, closed door consultations on it at the UNSC. Uh, although there were no outcomes. Uh, I believe there's been a standing request from the British side to be allowed, to, to allow the diplomats to visit Kashmir. Uh, what's the current thinking back in London on the handling of the Kashmir issue by India? It's clear, and I think it's worth repeating, that the UK position on Kashmir is absolutely unchanged. Kashmir, I describe that broadly, is uh, for India and Pakistan to resolve together and bilaterally, respecting the wishes of the Kashmiri people. Um, the Security Council uh, discussion yesterday was uh, had on the back of a proposition by China uh, under an any other business proposal to, to have a discussion. Now, in terms of the Security Council, it's very normal for members and it is their right to bring AOB points to the council. However, we would say uh, very clearly that Kashmir is for India and Pakistan to work on together bilaterally, respecting the wishes of the Kashmiri people. I repeat myself because it's worth repeating. But internally, I mean, the, 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 the demand from all the European countries from the West that, you know, the restrictions within Kashmir should be lifted and possibly diplomats should be allowed to visit, more diplomats should be allowed to visit. Well, uh, we've all seen and heard uh, His Excellency Prime Minister Modi's commitments to 
um, a, a, a prosperous, successful future for India administered Kashmir. So um, that is a commitment that is clearly set out. Uh, obviously, uh, it is uh, important in that that the government of India be able to demonstrate what it is doing in that regard. And uh, therefore, being able to see what is happening there is, a, is an evidently sensible requirement. So yes, um, we have uh, made plain that we are very ready to go and look at uh, the situation uh, on the ground. And uh, I think uh, the government here is, is very well aware of that. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you on the show. It was my pleasure and uh, let us do it again. Thank you.